All right, we're green. Good? All right, very good. So I just want to give you a word of caution, especially with everything that is going on currently. It seems to change every day, and so now you're seeing some uh, things going on and people who are justifying tearing up stuff and doing things and hurting people and, and all that. Um, just be um, ever mindful that a steady appetite of that uh, will cause you to get overly anxious and uh, cause you to be overly uh, concerned and bothered and worried about things that you can't control. What that leads to is frustration. We're presenting you with a problem you can't fix. And now that you have a problem that you can't fix, what do you do about it? Well, it's like I should be doing something about it because they keep telling me about it. But I can't do anything about it. But they keep telling me about it. So does that mean what am I supposed to? We'll do something about it. I can tell you as a suggestion, one of the best things you can do is change the channel. But don't go from Fox to CBS to NBC to ABC to then uh, CNN or whatever the other news channels are and that kind of a thing. Just suggest a little bit of it goes a long way. Now, if you've been overly inundated with that stuff and you're just, you're just fixated on that, just understand that that stuff can grab a, ha grab a hold of you and can encapsulate your attention and get your eyes off the Lord and get your eyes off of what's going on in your own spiritual life and get your eyes on trying to fix something you can't fix. You can only fix yourself. So whatever side of the thing you get on, there's no point in you getting into an argument to mask or not to mask or to glove or not to glove or whatever. You say, well, your deacon's got on a mask and glove. He's got cancer. The Kothoviak's got on mask and glove. He's got heart trouble. So if it fits for you, that's fine. It doesn't mean they're any more spiritual or less spiritual. It just means, you know, well, you feel good. Well, okay, you're well. You feel good. You don't have to do that. We went today to the oncologist, and you walk there, and there's this huge sign. You can't walk in that door without the full-blown temperature check. And if you had this, and answer a litany of questions. and that, But you're going in around sick people. So they have you mask up for the protection of the people that are in there taking their treatments. So, but that's not where we are here. So all I wanted to do is, is just simply say that, and we're going to get into the, the last days here. If you want to know about eschatology, I'm going to give you a little bit of it tonight. But it's not going to be the way that you might think it is. As I told you on Sunday, what they're trying to do now is, is to take the Bible to give them some authority behind what's going on to give you an answer for some things they can't answer. What they can't answer right now is, is why is all this happening? Well, the wages of sin is what? Okay, so you have all the things that are taking place, but it's not the tribulation period. It's a natural way that things continue to go, that when people turn away from God, then God says, okay, no problem. He's a gentleman. You don't want me? No problem. You know what he does? He just backs away. I don't agree at all with all the things that uh, the daughter of Billy Graham has said, and there's a litany of those things. But she made a profound statement after the towers came down in 2001. And when those towers came down, you know what she said? She said it's an illustration of what happens when God pulls away from a nation. If God just removes His hand of protection for just a little while, that's an illustration of that. I don't care if you believe a conspiracy. I don't care if you believe the Mossad did it. I don't care if you believe the Bushes were behind it and it was an oil scheme and it was done by the Saudis and that kind of a deal. I don't, it doesn't make any difference what human instrument was used. God knew the thing was going to go on. You say, what happens? Well, you don't want God to be in your nation anymore. You don't want God in your schools anymore. You don't want the Ten Commandments around. So guess what you have now? You have people that are running around acting like complete fools. You have people running around that have absolutely no remorse whatsoever of the things that they're doing. They have no remorse of literally nearly beating people to death and don't bother them at all. They laugh and cut up and take videos of it. They're gang uh, uh, doing things as gangs and groups of people and beating people and burning stuff. And there's, there's no feeling of, of hindrance whatsoever. You say, why? A nation has been raised without God. So there's nothing to restrain them. So what does that mean? Oh, it means we're in the tribulation. Oh, stop trying to make yourself the prophet. And I told you these things were coming. Listen, the Bible says that in the last days, these are the perilous times that are going to come and people are going to act out of character. And they're acting stupid. Uh, they, don't, they don't care about breaking in stuff, about stealing stuff, about burning stuff. You say, why? You have a nation that's been raised of entitlement where they believe they deserve things. And if they don't get it, covetous, they're going to take it. 
Why? They're entitled to it. You owe it to me because I'm breathing air. I didn't get what I feel like I should get and I'm not going to work a job to get it because I've been held down and kept back. And that's white, black, pink, purple, tan, yellow. It doesn't make any difference. It's across everything. And it ain't just happening in the United States. What is that? That's human nature. Me first. That's what happens in every marriage. That's what happens with kids. That's what happens in school. That's what happens in business. It's me first. It's covetousness. It's I want what I want and I want what you've got because I deserve it and you don't. So when you have a nation that's raised that way, you can't expect anything but that. It's just a matter of when it's going to happen. And now it's beginning to happen. And when's it going to stop? Don't know. What do you think's at the heart of it? You hear all of these pundits that are coming up. Well, if we would just do that, it would fix it. Well, how's that working out for you? You know how they're going to probably have to fix it? They're going to have to do one or two things, let them burn it until there's nothing left to burn, or they're going to have to have some kind of intervention that says, you've gone as far as we're going to let you go, and now we're going to put a stop to it. Now, I, I know where that's going, and I know if this is going out, that then there's going to be somebody, see, that's martial law. Okay, well, what is it called and somebody's breaking into your house and tearing up your house and trying to rape your wife and you decide to defend yourself? What's that called? Is that called martial law? What is that? <laughs> Isn't that defending your life and your property? That's not stand your ground. That is, wait a minute, I worked for this. You don't get to come burn it down. But you see, it's so twisted now, it's like, Oh, well, you, you shouldn't feel that way. It's not very Christian for you to feel like somebody... Really? You're going to let somebody smack your wife and you're just going to say, well, now I'm a Christian and I'm not going to let you do that. I'm going I'm, I'm to allow you to do that to my family? You're twisted if you think that. Now, here's the thing you have to realize, or maybe you should consider understanding. They're going to make a decision at some point how far to go. How does that affect you? Well, unless you're directly involved in it, the best thing you can do is concentrate on something you can control. That's your own actions and your own spiritual consequences for what you do. That's all you can do. You can't control other people. But you can let other people control you. Now, are you controlled by what everybody's telling you to do? Or are you going to do what's right and reasonable in your own eyes? Well, I don't think there's anything wrong with gathering with more than 10 people in a particular place at a particular time and all that. Okay, fine. Go ahead and do what you want to do. We choose not to do that. Well, y'all are wrong and we're right. Okay, have a nice day. We choose to do what the government told us to do because we felt like it's the right thing to do. It's just like what he just did with youth camp. We talked and talked and talked and prayed and prayed and prayed and found out what the restrictions were going to be down there and made a decision to, to cancel that. Well, we think it's stupid for you to cancel it. Okay, send your kids to camp. I don't care. <laughs> They're not coming to our camp. You say, well, that's crazy. Okay, well, we're not going to have them stay eight to a dorm and only be able to play with the kids in the dorm and be sitting separate from everybody the whole time. And if anybody shows any signs of a fever or a cough or whatever, you've got to have everybody tested and the whole dorm gets locked down. And all. I'm not going to put your kids, neither is he, in that kind of a situation. Well, we just think you're afraid of the virus and more afraid of the virus than God. I'm not putting the kids to a spiritual test. You're not being tested now. We opened the doors on Wednesday night because some of you wanted to come to church on Wednesday night. So good, the doors are open, but they've been closed a long time. Why? We felt it was the right thing to do. We're going to open up next Sunday night coming around. We still have some people that have pre-existing conditions and things like that that are not comfortable being in a congregation of people yet. Okay, great. Let them wait until they feel safe. I don't want them coming in here with a gun to their head. You say, why? Because they're not going to listen to anything I have to say anyway. They're coming with a bad spirit. Well, I guess I better go to church. They'll be talking about me. God help you if you're talking about somebody that don't come like you come. Thank God you're healthy enough to come. We don't make you spiritual. It just means, hey, I'm, I'm able to come. I feel well enough to be able to do that. But things are spinning out of control. You say, why? God told you in the last days, the things with personality disorders and human nature is going to rise to the top. And it doesn't mean that people are psychos. Take your Bible and look in 2 Timothy, if you will, please. And notice what he says, in the last days perilous times shall come and there'll be earthquakes and famines and pestilences and wars and riots and rumors of wars. And <laughs> No, that's Matthew 24 for the tribulation. Here's what he says, men will be lovers of them own selves. We covered that. You telling me you're not living in that time now? 
You live in the most narcissistic society that has ever been upon the face of this earth. You think I'm kidding you? Don't pull through a traffic light. Get hung up texting while somebody's behind you and the light turns green. And tell me they won't lay on the horn for you to get out of their way because they got somewhere to go because they're special. You live in a society that says it's all about me. Now, I already gave you this, and not to reiterate too much, but in Laodicea, that's the last church, the rights of the people rises above God's rights. So what are you hearing now? What are you hearing broadcast? While well, you're seeing an independent, fundamental, Bible-believing Baptist church every day in the news media, you say, what are you hearing? The rights of the people, 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 the rights of the people. And they're saying, well, they have a right to protest. Okay, I agree, they do. They have a right to kill people in protest? Well, some people say it's a protest. You mean there's no governor on it? Is a protest considered burning buildings and breaking windows and hurting people and shooting policemen on sight and running over policemen? That's the very fabric of society. Listen, whether you like it or don't like it, better than 95% of the individuals that have ever been a policeman have never dishonored their uniform. You just hear about the few that do. And I'll grant you, there are some that do, no question about it, as in any other profession. But the bottom line is, is when you start attacking that, you become a lawless society. You know what you're saying? I'll be my own law. Well, you're headed for trouble. You say, why? Uh, those are the people that keep you from getting broke into at night while your little peepers are closed. And those are the people that come when you get wrapped around a tree. And those are the people that come when you're fighting or arguing with your husband or your wife. And those are the people that come out there and spend time away from their family to take care of your family. And those are the people that will defend you, even if you're wrong, if you decide to protest in a reasonable and peaceable manner. And they'll defend your right to do that. And nowadays, you know what you have? You have a bunch of hoodlums going around and they're ripping the very fabric of society. Why? You're in the last day. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. Now, let me ask you a question. I thought this the other day. I saw a bunch of them running around in one of the cities. They were broadcasting and whoever had the biggest fire burning, they're showing that and all that stuff. And I'm looking at that and I thought to myself, I wonder how many of those people say they're Christians. How many of them people were in church on Sunday and they're out there on the street on Monday acting like that? I wonder how many have been supported by preachers and pastors to say, you should get up there and do it. Can I ask you a question? Short of them doing that, what's the difference in a bunch of people going up to the Capitol and parking their uh, church buses and school buses and all up there and protesting against the government because they're in lockdown and shutting everything down and blocking up and locking up the whole city where people can't get to and from hospitals and to and from places to work and to and from places of business and things like that. What's the difference except the violence? One of them was done in God's name. I'm sure I'm making a lot of great friends tonight. I'm positive of that. You say, why? Man has a natural rebellious spirit in him. And you've had people pent up for about eight weeks now and they're looking for any kind of cause whatsoever. And now they've turned the dogs loose and they're out there doing things. And then what are they saying? It's about me. It's about me. It's about me. I'm angry. I'm mad. I'm frustrated. I'm, gonna do it. I'm looking at that crowd and I'm thinking, I wonder how many of them people are Christians acting like that. You say, what is it? Because what I'm fixing to show you is, is that it has an impact on the church. The rights of the people. So I flipped on the news for about, oh, about 5.45 or 6 o'clock this morning or so. I watched just to see which place of the, the cities they burned down over the nighttime or whatever it was. And I heard in about 10 minutes of the thing before I turned it off and we got busy doing stuff today. I, I watched about 10 minutes. And, you know, I bet you I heard a half a dozen times. They're, they claim they have a right. They claim they have a right. They claim they have a right. You know what I hear in churches nowadays? I have a right. Can you show me that in the Bible? Lovers of self more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. Can you show me the rights you have in the Bible? You have a right to die. You have a right to suffer. You have a right to pay taxes. Can you show me where in the Bible it's about your happiness? Could you show me that? Can you show me in the Bible where you're promised or guaranteed that everything is supposed to always go your way? Where did you get that? Where did that selfishness come from? Oh, you might find it, take your Bible, come to Isaiah chapter number 14. You might find it here. We're talking about lovers of self. Where did that mentality come from? 
Where, where did that riotous living come from? That ungoverned, ungoverned concupiscence, that, that unnatural wanting to get something you didn't work for. Where did that come from? Where did that, if I can't get them to give it to me, I'll take it from them. Where did that come from? Have you ever wondered where it's in the Bible? Look, if you will, it's Isaiah chapter 14. Look in verse number 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nation? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. And you see the Lord's response? Well, I, listen, Satan. Listen, Lucifer. Lux Fierro, the light bearer, I, 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 listen, I don't want to hurt your feelings. And I don't want to upset you. So you just go ahead and come on up here and encroach into heaven. And you just come on up here and you take rulership over what you believe you should rule. Because after all, you've been suppressed and put down for all this time. And I gave you a job, but it wasn't good enough. You wanted my job. And so, hey, I, I, listen, I, I, just, I just want to be a compromiser. And, and we want to just all get along. No, it's not what he said. Did you read the next verse? Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell in the sides of the pit. They shall see narrow, they shall, they that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee saying, is this the man that made the earth to tremble and did shake the kingdom and made the world a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof and opened not the house? What happened to him? God kicked him out. You say, why? For his rebellious attitude. Come over to 1 Samuel chapter 15. You say, what's the root of that, preacher? The root of that is self-love. The root of that's covetousness. The root of that is, I want something that God didn't give me that I deserve. That's the devil. That's the devil. You know what covetousness is? Covetous is, I want something sometimes not even because I really want it. I just don't want you to have it. That's real covetousness. I don't like you. I can't believe God gave that to you. I want to take it from you, not because I want it or even have any need of it, but because of what you got as a result. I hate you so bad, I will do anything to take that from you. You know what you do a lot of times? You look at somebody else and their relationship and you think, I deserve that. Well, says who? What did the Lord deserve when He came down? You ever think about that? Did He deserve to be treated the way He was? I mean, why didn't they roll out a throne for Him? Did you ever at one time hear Him say, do you realize who you're messing with? Do you realize where I came from? Do you realize I made all this stuff? Who are you to be treating me the way you're treating me? Send me in on the colt, the fold of an ass, in here and nailing me to a cross naked as the day I was born and laughing and belittling and making fun of me. I made you. You never hear him say that. You don't hear the Lord talk that way. You don't even hear the Apostle Paul speak that way. With one exception, when a guy smites him, he said, the Lord smite thee, you whited wall. You know what the Lord said? That'll cost you, boy. I told you that's what you were going to get. I told you I must show him what great things he must suffer. Paul had a thorn in his flesh till the day he died after he got caught up and saw the things up there in heaven and so on and so forth and was with the Lord on the backside of the desert. You know what Paul did? If he's our apostle, he comes along and he spends a life of suffering. Read 1 Corinthians 11 and read all the things through there that Paul went through, and all, or 2 Corinthians 11, all the things that the apostle Paul went through there and, and suffered through that kind of stuff as an example. And yet what you hear now is, my rights, my rights, my rights. Your rights according to what? It ain't a Bible, it's a constitution. And while I respect every policeman and every soldier and every first responder and every mother and every wife and every kid who sacrificed the ultimate sacrifice by letting their loved one go fight battles and wars to give us the freedom we have, I don't care how much blood was spilt to obtain that. It doesn't trump the Bible. Amen. I respect them. I honor them. They honor to whom honors do. But you don't worship that over the Bible. And now I have a certain right, unenalienable right. That ain't what the Bible says. That's what the Constitution says. But one of them appeals to that flesh. And one of them tells every man under the sound of my voice right now and every woman that you're entitled to happiness. That's why you're irresponsible. 
That's why you won't suck it up and do what you're supposed to do. Because you don't have what it takes to be a Christian man or a woman because you think it's all about you. Well, I, I'm not happy. Well, join the crowd. There ain't nobody happy all the time. Nobody. 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 Somebody put that in your brain. You know, one of the most things that will lead to that stuff, nowadays they got it, or they do on my computer. I don't know about yours. Maybe you don't have it. I even have stuff pop up sometimes when I'm trying to look up the stuff as far as the church is concerned. There's stuff popping up there all the time. I've never bought none of the stuff. I've never seen the stuff. And they're kind of like, you need this. And I'm like, I need that like a hole in the head. Oh, okay. Well, then take the Google ad off and say why you didn't like it and it doesn't apply and we'll find something that applies to you. To get more of my money? What, why, why are the, to, to say, you need this. It'll make you so much better if you just get this. You'll be happy if you get it. Thank the Lord they're not showing pictures of other women up there saying, if you trade in the one you got and get this one, you'll be happy. You know, that kind of thing. Maybe some of y'all have those. Some of you probably think if you made the change, you'd be happy. The problem is not who you're with. The problem's you. Amen. Amen. So, you know what? I turn on the box. And we've gotten where now she watches these things that don't have the commercials. I get so wore out with it. You watch a 30-minute show or an hour-long show, but there's 15 minutes of commercials. That wears me out to tell me I need a car or I need some kind of medicine. And then if I took the medicine and then I have side effects to sue the people that gave you the medicine because you're supposed to be happy after you take the medicine. It was supposed to make you well, but it didn't make you well. It made you worse. And so therefore you should sue them and then you'll be happy if you sue them. By the way, we get a 35% cut. So if you took that medicine and your legs fell off, get in your wheelchair, roll over here and get us and we'll get you compensated for your legs and then you'll be happy. See, it's about that's what drives it. If you get this food, if you buy this, they're always telling me I'm fat. You say, how do you know? They're not telling you. Yes, they do. Always. They're slim fast on here. And that if you eat this and if you eat this way, if you go to groom or noom or whatever the other thing is and change how you think about food and, and that kind of a thing. And they're advertising food. You don't eat this and you can lose 70 pounds in two weeks, you know, and that kind of a thing. Comes with a needle and thread to sew your mouth shut and, and that kind of thing. But, but it's kind of like, I'm, I'm offended. You're telling me I'm fat. Well, no, we're not really. Well, then why are you showing me diet commercials? And eating plastic food. And you can eat all this food and lose weight. Somebody's lying. You can't lose weight if you keep eating. Unless you got cancer. Then you eat all you want and you die anyway. But I'm, but I'm simply saying to you, that's a, that's a strange thing to me. You say, what does it do? It feeds the covetousness. It feeds that idea, that thought. You deserve more and if you had it, you'd be happy. You'd be happy. You'd be happy. You'd be happy. That old preacher said one time something real profound. He said, I could stand right here and I could draw a 90-mile circle all around this place and I can tell you what everybody in that circle is looking for. And he paused for effect and he said, everybody in that circle is looking for happiness. Well, what does happiness mean to you? It means something different to everybody in here. I'd just be happy if I didn't have to go to work. I'd just be happy if I could, you know, uh, not if I could go uh, play sports all day long. I'd be happy if I didn't have to go to school. I'd be happy if I didn't have to fill in the blank. See, that's not God doing that. God didn't put that in you. He said, rejoice uh, uh, again. Again, I say what? Rejoice. Rejoice in tribulation. Rejoice in trouble. Rejoice in trial. Paul said, you're given on you the half of Jesus Christ to suffer. Say, rejoice. 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 He didn't say happy. Tell me Paul's happy being in prison. <laughs> Oddest thing in the world is in Acts chapter 27 over there. Paul comes out of prison and they say, Paul, we're going to let you speak for yourself. What do you think? He said, I think myself happy. You're happy? You've been sitting in prison, Paul. Yeah, yeah, I think this is great, man. This is a blessing. I've always wanted a congregation like this to preach to. <laughs> it's not the way I'd gone about it, but man, what a blessing, he says. I'm happy. Happy? How can you be happy, Paul? You got a cloak on, and that's all you got. No camel, no donkey. You don't even have parchments. Come before a window and bring the parchments and so on and so forth. And by the way, it's getting cold in here. I'm getting to be old up here. Bring me a coat with you and hurry up and come before winter because my time's about up. You know what the Apostle Paul says? He said, I'm happy. Well, Paul, where's the possessions? I don't, they're on the other side. Where's the crowns? They're on the other side. 
Where's the rejoicing? It's on the other side. Well, Paul, where's the recognition? It's on the other side. Were you telling me, Paul, that you're happy right now? Man, I'm happier than I've ever been. Paul, something's wrong with you. You're, you're, you're psychologically whacked out. Mm -hmm. I am, but I'm not a Laodicean Christian. I'm not so caught up in the world that I can't see heavenly things. Let me show you where it comes from. Look, if you will, 1 Samuel chapter number 15. You know the passage, I'm sure. The apostle, I mean the apostle uh, Samuel's fixing to show up here at a, at a barbecue. And uh, Saul has gone in there and he's supposed to do some things. And he's supposed to slay Agag and so on and so forth. And they're going to the city. And once they get into the city, they go in there and look in verse 18. The Lord sent them on a journey and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they be consumed. And then he says this, uh, when I came in, verse 17 is what I'm looking for. When thou wast little in thine own sight, thou wast not made a head of the tribes of Israel, and the Lord anointed thee king over Israel. Yeah, preacher, you're right. I, when I was a nobody, God made me something. Okay, did the Lord give you an order? Yes. Verse 19, Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil and didst evil in the sight of the Lord? W what? I I'm asking you a question. Saul, did God take you from nothing and make you something? Oh yeah, amen, preacher. That's right. Yeah, hallelujah. Did God grant you the victory over the Amalekites? Yeah, amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Did the Lord tell you to, to slay everyone utterly old and young and take all their stuff and destroy it and all that kind of... Yeah, yeah. Well, did you, did you do that? Because if you did, I kind of want to know, why don't you keep the stuff for yourself? Aren't you a king? Don't you already have everything that anybody could ever want? But it's never enough, is it? The kid's sick. Lord, if you just hit my kid well, I promise you I'll never ask for anything else. And then the kid gets well, and then it's kind of like, well, Lord, it'd be nice if I had. I'm not trying to be hard on you. I'm just trying to point out something that within, within two words, perilous times shall come in the last days. And the first thing he said, love herself, covetous. Before I even move in the rest of the other 23, there's 25 of them, 5 times 5, and he's going to tell you the state of the last church. And we have to take a realistic look at it for ourselves. Here's Saul. He's the king of Israel. He's been given an order and been given a great victory. And Samuel comes in, and by the way, Samuel's running late on purpose to see what Saul's going to do because there's nothing like time that reveals the heart of a man. And things aren't moving quick enough for Saul. So Saul is going to say, you know something? I'm not going to wait on him. I can do it. I can do whatever I need to be. I'm, I, I ain't waiting around. I got to get moving here. Why? Because I need to get the spoil for myself and get the recognition for winning the battle because it is all about me. That's why Samuel very wisely says, uh, let me just ask a question. Make sure I got the history right. Weren't you little in your own eyes? No self-esteem, nothing. You weren't looking to be in it. You never saw yourself as a king. Yes, sir, that's right. Absolutely. And didn't God pick you out of all the people he could have picked and made you what you are today? Well, yeah. Well, let me ask you a question. How come you're here today? Didn't God see fit to intervene in your life? You forgot, didn't you? Didn't God get you out of a financial jam? You forgot, didn't you? Didn't God get you well when you should have stayed uh, in the hospital? You forgot. Are the kids? You forgot, didn't you? Didn't God keep you together when you should have blowed apart? You forgot, didn't you? Didn't you forget? Saul, didn't you forget something? You're here because of God. You're, you're not here because of you. You got here because of God, but... That covetous eye got a hold of Saul. And notice what he said. He said, you flew upon the spoil and you did uh, evil in the sight of the Lord. Watch this Saul's response. Uh, yeah, I've obeyed the voice of the Lord and have gone the way which the Lord sent me and have brought Agag and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people... Now, now listen, preacher. I did what I was supposed to do, but I can't answer for the people. The people did this. Man, you talk about a horrible leader. He's now going to blame the one who are suppo he's supposed to be leading him. A leader would say, my fault, I misled him. 
David says in 1 Samuel chapter number 30, follow me or I die alone. I'm going to go get them because why? It's my fault that we were out of position when the Amalekites came in here and they took over the city of Ziklag and burned it and took our wives and our kids and, our, and so on and so forth and took all the spoil. I'm going to talk to the Lord about what to do and then I'm going to pursue after them. Not Lord, if these warriors had done and if these people had done and Lord, if that. You know what Saul always does? It's somebody else's fault. It's always somebody else's fault. Aren't you hearing a little bit of that today? When the virus came around, isn't it because China sent it over here from a wet market? Okay, great. It came from there. But in the meantime, we got it. We got to deal with it. But the first duck of a demon-possessed individual is, I did what I was supposed to do. God told me. Why, you cotton-picking liar, Saul. No, you did not. You're responsible for the people under your command. Those people did not do that without you condoning what they did. You see, their responsibility is fixing to fall right back on Saul. You know what Saul immediately did? He extricated himself from Satan and said, oh, 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 me? Pure as the driven snow, live at the foot of the cross. You want to see holiness and purity? Look it up in the dictionary. You'll see my picture right there. Now, but them people. You know how them people are, preacher. Now, I, I'm just saying, preacher, I, I don't want to talk about them. We need to pray for them, but them people, preacher. He got on Facebook and said, the people. The people. The people. Do you know what the first three words of the Constitution are? It ain't one nation under God. We, the people. In order to form a more perfect union. Wow, what's more perfect than your union with Jesus Christ? There's some inequity there, I think. I, I'm just guessing. I mean, and we're saying that we all are created with unenalienable rights and the right to pursue what? Ha, what? You're kidding me. That's in the Constitution and not the Bible? I'm shocked. It's got to be in the Bible in that verse that says cleanliness is next to godliness. Or God helps them to help themselves. Right there it is. You have a right to happiness. Tell that to people in foreign countries. Tell that to people in Mongolia that live in mud huts and die in mud huts. Tell that to the people in South Africa in squatters camps. Tell that to people in Vanilla that live in the streets. Tell that to the people in Brazil that, that are jammed in like so many people on a postage stamp they can't even breathe and are surviving by eating out of garbage dumps. We have a right to be happy. Where'd you get that? Well, you're kind of narrow-minded, aren't you? You're kind of thinking about just yourself, aren't you? I don't care about all them people. Uh, we're having, okay, what did you do with all that? I have a right. Okay, well, let's just stay in the Bible, okay, lest I digress. I do get a little upset because I hear preachers pound on the pulpit that we have a right. We have a, I'm thinking, wait a minute. Now, before you get upset now, I'm a preacher so I can talk about preachers. But it's time that we as preachers look at ourselves and not just look at the people and say, it's the people, it's the people. That's called the Saul syndrome. I ain't done nothing wrong. Right? Ain't that what he says? Your Bible student? You can pick up the pace just a little, but your Bible student, right? Okay. Is that what it says? I did right. Look, look, look at it in the Bible. I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. God told me. You know, God only deals with me and I've done exactly what God told me to do. You know what you'll find out in a lot of cases, and this may or may not be true for you, you'll find out that the things that you're guilty of between you and God, you'll often see in your family or in the people that you're over. Saul had not been obedient to the Lord and the people had not been obedient to Saul. Imagine that, you reap what you sow. Imagine that Saul said, I've done what the Lord said. And the people, it's the people's fault. 
Listen, Samuel, if you're upset with anybody, be upset with the people. Don't be upset with me. I'm, I'm as good as it gets. Watch, have gone the way which the Lord has sent me, have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and utterly destroyed the Amalekite. But the people took of the spoil, the sheep, the oxen, the chief things. Uh, they broke into the store and grabbed a bunch of stuff they hadn't paid for, which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as a great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice and obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and hearken to the fat of rams. We've got to stop. Because when Samuel first walked in, you know what he said? Saul, I want to ask you a question. Have you done what the Lord asked you to do? Yes, sir. He said, really? You sacrificed all the, the sheep and the oxen and the lambs and the he goats and all that? Well, absolutely. He said, that's interesting. If that's the case, what is this? The bleeding of the sheep in my ear and the lowing of the oxen. The animals are talking, Saul. Oh, well, yeah, there's that. But see, I'm kind of smarter than God. I know what's good for us to keep and for us to throw. We, we got rid of the coals. We got rid of the, the, the ones that were not genetically correct. We, got, we, 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 we did that. But the best breeding stock, you know, we, we kept it for ourselves. I mean, why would God want us to do that? I don't know, Saul. Do you remember Jericho? Do you remember AI? That's mine. You got your stuff and God's stuff mixed up. But here it is not possessions. It is Saul taking authority where only God should have authority. Saul, you're supposed to do what God said and God speaks through you and you're to direct the people as God has directed you. You don't get to appoint yourself as God. Dad, preacher, pastor, Sunday school teacher, mom, you got to do what the Bible says. See, it's tough there. Well, but under the circumstances. Okay, well, hold on. Watch what happens. He says, Samuel, in verse number 22, The Lord hath great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice, and obeying the voice of the Lord, obey, is better than sacrifice, hearken the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as I, and, 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 I, and iniquity as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. You can't handle it. You know what God said to Saul over this? He didn't say this to him when he killed other people. He didn't say this to him when he manipulated things in the kingdom. He didn't say this to him when he took advantage of David. He didn't say any of that. You know what he just said here? Because you didn't do what I said to do, but you said you did, you lost the kingdom. Can I make a practical illustration for you? How does that apply to me in the Pauline epistles? In Ephesians, the book of Ephesians, chapter number 5, and also in the book of Colossians, and over there in Galatians, chapter number 5, you know what he says? They that do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. You don't lose your salvation. You lose your inheritance. Because you're saying that you're doing it, but you're not. Look, if you will, come over to Galatians. Rebellion is as the sin of what? Wow, that's pretty heavy. Witchcraft. And then who does Saul wind up consorting with at the end of his life? The witch. Do you remember what her name was? The witch of what? You know what, uh, uh, what was her name? Um, the nose lady, what was her name? Bewitched. What, but what was her name? Samantha. Her mom's name was Endora. Excuse me, of all the names they could come up with on a show that doesn't really seem to be that kind of a big deal, and twitch your nose, and you kids are like, well, I don't even know what you're talking about. But even way back then, you know what her mama was? And she was considered to be a wicked woman and was always having problems with a, Samantha's husband and stuff like that. You know what her name was? Endora. You say, where'd they get it? Right there. Saul's consenting with uh, consorting with the witch of Endor. Oh, preacher, that, yeah, you can't make that stuff up. That's just a coincidence. Okay, sure it is. Of all the names, why that? Why Endora? 
Look, if you will, please, in Galatians chapter number 5, I'm just going to make a, a suggestion to you that in the last days, covetousness gets ahead of obedience. He says stubbornness or, 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 or uh, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. What is rebellion? He's accusing Saul of not doing what God said to do to the letter. And he's saying you're rebelling against God. And what does it do? It causes you to conjure another spirit. So it looks like that when we choose to rebel against God, there's another spirit right there waiting to come up and say, I'm with you. And gives you support for what you're doing. You ever been in an argument with somebody? And things seem to be going pretty good until you kind of trip their trigger and they kind of cross that line a little bit. And then the next thing you know, you're like, where'd that come from? If they're saved, the possibility exists that the Lord came and said, okay, need to cool your heels, need to chill out. But when that rebellion takes place, something else comes up and emboldens them. And then you can't make any sense with them. If you watched any of the crowds at all, I don't recommend you watch much. If you watch any of the crowds at all, there are people that are there having confrontations face to face, knowing they're going to get hooked up, knowing they're going to wind up, you know, in, in a bad place and that kind of a deal. But if you ever notice, there's a point there where they just refuse to back down. They won't listen to orders anymore, even though they realize their very life could be at stake. Have you ever noticed that? You say, what is that? It's the same spirit. It's the you are not going to tell me what to do. I'm lawless, Isaiah 14. Is it making any sense to you? You say, what does it come from? I want my rights. I want what I want. You don't find a rebellious bone in the body of Jesus Christ. Now, here's what a narcissist will do with that. He'll always say, you're the one not obeying God. He'll always say, you're the one not being obedient to God. He'll use the Bible to manipulate you to make you feel guilty for something you're not guilty of. And because you're sensitive, you're thinking, well, maybe, maybe the problem is me. And now what he's done is, is transfer the guilt that he or she should have and put it on you. Instead of going, I was wrong. I messed up. You can watch him switch just like that. Watch, Galatians chapter number 5, what did Saul lose? Today, he said, you lost the kingdom. And the first thing that Saul says to Samuel is, okay, 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 you got me. You're right, you're right, no problem. Listen, hey, can we like keep this between ourselves? You're right, you're, you're right, I was wrong. He's only saying that because he got caught. He's not truly repenting. How do you know? Because he's saying instead of suffering, he did a public sin. And instead of making that thing and saying to the people, I messed up, go bring all of those animals in here. Go bring Agag in here, which hasn't come up yet. Go bring Agag in here. Let's do what God says to do. Why? I was wrong. I messed up. We are going to do exactly what God says to do. Instead, he goes, okay, 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 look, I, you're right, but can I keep the stuff? And can you just keep this between us? Because I don't need the people to know that. And Samuel said, man, are you smoking crack? Do you understand the seriousness of this? This ain't about the, the sheep and the oxen. This isn't about Agag. This is you're a king and you disobey God. What kind of an example is that? That's what got Achan in trouble. I don't know that he said stupid. He was always respectful, but he's like, really? Okay, you got me, he said. But let's just keep it here. And then he said, let me ask you one more question. What about Agag? Did you hew him to pieces? That was part of the order. Well... No, but I got him on a long chain. What? You kept the king on a chain? Yeah, but he's under my control. God told you to kill him because you think you got him on a chain, but you're holding the chain. Somebody that is going to throw coal at somebody else has to dirty their hand first. Somebody that you're angry with, mad with, bitter against, you're thinking, I'm holding that against them. They got you. 
you're under their control because you're holding the end of the chain. I got him on a chain, preacher. Can bring him out anytime I want. Really, what would be the purpose of you doing that? Could I ask you a question, Saul? Do you think maybe that the reason that the Lord wanted you to kill him was because he knew you would use it as an opportunity to lift yourself up and to increase your reputation among people? Do you think maybe, possibly, God knew what he was doing when he said to kill him and instead you once again usurped your authority over God's authority, Isaiah 14, and you said, Lord, I, I know what you said, kill him, but I, I, I got him encapsulated. He's on a chain. Yeah, and you got to feed him, and you got to clothe him, and you got to water him, and you have to have people to protect him, and people to watch over him, and people to make sure nobody breaks him out, and you have to have a place to be able to keep him, and that's what some of you do now. God said, why don't you just kill it and let it go, and you're like, uh-uh. Nah, and you know what you're doing? You're expending every dime you have to keep that thing alive. You're bitter, and you're still bitter, and you've been bitter for years and years and years. Yeah, but I, the Lord said, why don't you let the thing go? I told a fellow I was talking to one time, he was pretty mad about some things that had happened to him. And I said, man, I sure am glad you're not upset with me. He said, yeah, why is that? I said, you'd never forgive me. I said, one mistake with you is the end of life. He goes, well, you know, some people do certain things. And I said, I sure am glad you ain't Jesus. And a hush fell across the crowd. You know what he says? Do you believe the Bible? Could I ask, could I show you so hands you see, believe the Bible? You know what he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2? He said that when you refuse to forgive people and continue to hold it against them, you know what he says? The devil takes you captive and he said, for we're not ignorant of his devices because you won't forgive them. You say, why do you think that is? God told you to kill it. You still got it on the chain, don't you? You know, to manipulate them. Keep them, hold them. Say, preacher, that, 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 that's crazy. Well, I'm sorry to say this. I think you're the one crazy if you don't believe what the Bible says about it because you're the one in bondage about it. It ain't bothering them at all. You're taking medication. They own vacation. You all jacked up every which way. You can't believe somebody else is actually talking to them. And you're, you're just, I mean, and now you ain't going to talk to who talked to them. Right? You're the one upset. You're the one in a knot. You're the one can't sleep at night. They're over there. And they got friends and you're like, I ain't friends with nobody. And they're all having friends of friends of yours. And now I ain't talking to them no more. Wow. Who you got on a chain? You're getting part of a message that I prepared before the virus and I wanted to preach it but I kind of thought it would be a little insensitive during the time of the virus to preach such a hard message. But boy, that's a hard message. That don't have nothing to do with smoking, drinking, cussing, chewing or nothing else. That has to do with domestic stuff. That has to do with me and you. That has to do with I have a right to feel this way because I was taken advantage of. Okay. Are you in Galatians 5? What happened? He said, you lost the kingdom. And he goes over there and he says, okay, all right, preacher, don't tell nobody. And he reaches to grab him and whoosh, he rips his garment. And Samuel turns around and he said, today the Lord rent the kingdom from thee and walked out. You say, why? It wasn't Samuel cursing him. Samuel said, Saul, you tore your britches, son. You didn't do what God told you to do. And I gave you three chances in that passage for you to repent and get right over it. And instead, all you kept doing was making excuses. Well, the people, well, the timing. Well, if you'd have been on time, none of this would have ever happened. And if you'd have done this and you'd have done that, I gave you all that and you never would turn. That's it. You know what he says in 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2? In 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2, after the rapture happens, it says, because they received not the love of the truth and that they'll be condemned and they'll be condemned to damnation because they wouldn't receive the truth when they heard it. And the Lord said, time's up. And they don't die. They go in the tribulation. They can't get saved. You say, why? God said they wouldn't take it when they had a chance to get it. So, just like Saul, that's it. You're done. You say, well, but he continued to be king for a while. Yeah, what a miserable existence. God never, never lifted it. And you know what's sad? You never see Saul saying, you know something, Lord? You're right. You never see David do that. Let me show you losing the kingdom. I left my watch. Brother Mitch, what time is it?
Don't you lie. Five till eight. Can you give me five minutes? I know I was going quite that long. I hope I'm not boring you to death. Isn't it, isn't it interesting how clear the Bible is on things that are apropos for 2020? Now, unless you think, well, I'm not a Saul. Well, you're kings and priests. You were nothing and God made you something when you got saved. This is a pretty good fit, I think. You can see the type in it. All right, now watch. Galatians chapter number 5. He said, now the works of the flesh, verse number 19. The works of the flesh and manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulation, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Pause. That's saved people that are walking according to the flesh. I just believe if you are saved, you wouldn't act like that. Well, the Bible says you can if you walk in the flesh. You're not lost, you're still saved, but you do lose something. And such less of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall what? How about that? So I lose an inheritance. Come to 2 Timothy. Back over to 2 Timothy 2. Thank you for the AC. Now, all I'm trying to do is, is to try to help you to understand that the power and the, and the behind the words of being obedient to God is the form of worship that the first time worship shows up in the Bible, it's connected with obedience. Yes, Abel is the sacrifice in Hebrews chapter number 11, but the first time the word worship shows up, it shows up where Abraham tells his son Isaac, I and the lad will go there to the mountain and worship, and it comes with Abraham obeying God to sacrifice his son. That's the pinnacle of the temple when it comes to worshiping God. I'm going to do what God says to do, even if it's at my expense. Most of us will say, I'll do what God says to do if it fits my plan. What Saul tried to do was use God to facilitate his plan. That's what he tried to do. He took the place of the preacher and said, here's what we're going to do. And I know what God said to do as far as sacrifice, and I know what God said to sacrifice, but you people did that. You got me in trouble. God doesn't hold the people accountable. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, He holds Saul accountable. You may fool everybody down here as to who's accountable for when you disobeyed God, but you don't fool God. God looks at you and He says, I don't care who you blame for it, it's you. I like that old adage that said, it's me, it's me, it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the knee of prayer. That's a good prayer for you to pray, but usually it's, Lord, it's them, it's them, it's them, O oh Lord, standing in the knee of prayer. Get them, God. Because God did something different than you thought it ought to be. And you're asking God to fix somebody instead of fixing yourself. Again, I apologize for being harsh, but you, your, your problem is, is that you won't fix you. It's somebody else. Always. 2 Timothy, if you will please, look in verse number 12. If we suffer, we shall also reign with Him. If we deny Him, He will deny us. Alright, you're in the Pauline epistles and you're in the day and age in which we live. And so let me ask you this question as you're flipping to Ephesians 5. I'm almost done. In Ephesians chapter number 5, you know what He just said right there? He said, if we suffer, we'll reign. And if we don't, He'll deny us. What did He deny us? The right to rule and reign. If we suffer, we'll reign. It has nothing to do with salvation. It has to do with how do I suffer. I do what God says to do, even if it costs me everything I have. That's rough. But that's what he said. He's not going to deny you entrance into heaven because you're saved. But you know what he said? Now I want to know if you love me. Well, how do I show him that, preacher? You show him that by your obedience to him. Could I ask you a question, sir or ma'am or kids? Would you do what the Bible said to do even if it goes contrary to what you want to do? 
I don't know. Maybe you will, maybe you won't. I don't know. But rebellion is a sin of witchcraft. And stubbornness is as idolatry. What's idolatry? It's the worship of yourself and your way. A little slow, aren't you, Saul? Well, yeah, but I mean, you know, yeah, I saw you fly upon the spoil. I saw you take the recognition. I saw you jump on the deal there. But uh, you're worshiping yourself there. Isn't that hand in hand with covetousness? Isn't that where we are in the passage? Isn't that self-love? Isn't that what idolatry is? The golden calf on two feet? I'm going to have my way? I don't care what you say. You know how many years you've done this to me? The guy told me after being married 35 years. Do you know how many years? Wow. Do you know the nation of Israel stayed in, uh, in uh, custody for over 400 years? And with the exception of them talking about going back when they got out of fellowship with the Lord, they didn't talk about where they came from again. You say, why? God drowned it out their past. It's It's strange. We'd be better to go back to Egypt and have garlic and leeks. They're all dead. <laughs> they drowned it in the Red Sea. What would they go back to? You read that and say, well, it's stupid for them to say that. The people were dead with the exception of the women and children. They drowned it. The whole army of Israel drowned. I mean, of, of Egypt drowned it. All right, look, if you will, please, in Ephesians 5. Ephesians chapter number 5. Look, if you will, in verse number 3. Fornication, uncleanness. Covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints, neither filthiness, foolish talking, jesting, or not convenient, but rather the giving of thanks. For this ye know, that no whoremonger, or unclean person, or covetous man, there it is again, covetous twice in three verses, who is an idolater, uh-oh, now you see the correlation in the two? Hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God? Whoa. I'm just giving you what the Bible said. You said you believe the Bible. Do you covet your freedom more than you covet being committed to Jesus Christ and doing what God says to do? You know what my situation is. Yes, somebody's convinced you you're supposed to have your form of whatever happiness is. I'm reminded to come to 1 Timothy 6 and I'll be done. 1 Timothy chapter number 6. I'm reminded of the, the, um, the colt, the fold of the ass. You know what he says? He said, boys, here's what I want you to do. And getting ready for the triumphal entry, uh, entrance into Jerusalem right before the crucifixion. Do you remember the story? And remember that the Lord said, here's what you do. You go find a colt tied up. The colt, the fold of an ass. Most people would think, well, how unkind and how cruel to take that colt and tie him up to a tree or to a fence post. What kind of life is that? Did you ever think that that colt being tied up was being kept for a special purpose and a special reason for a special time and that if God hadn't have tied him up there, he wouldn't have been where he needed to be if when God came along looking for him because he might have been like the ones that, oh, it was Saul that was looking for the wild asses who weren't tied up. His daddy's donkeys got away. For consideration, how come it is we're always rebelling about being tied up? Maybe the Lord's got you tied up for a reason. Because if you weren't tied up, you might be doing something you have no business doing. Sometimes He'll tie you up with sickness. Keep you at the house. Because if He didn't, you might get in a mess. Sometimes He'll tie you up with responsibility with work. Because if you didn't, you might get in a mess. Sometimes he ties you up with things that are occurring where you're so busy you can't break out and run. Why? You have responsibility. I don't like being tied up. Sometimes it's good to be tied up. You say, why? The Lord comes by and said, man, we've been looking for you. And you're right where the Lord said you'd be. And that colt would have said, if he could speak like uh, Balaam's ass talked, he would say this. I sure am glad the Lord tied me up because I've been looking out there in the far country. Man, I was thinking about jumping that fence, man. I was thinking about running out there. Look at all them donkeys out there having all that fun. Look at them all out there playing. Look at all them out there having the time of their life. Look at all them donkeys out there. Them mules, boy. Look at them out there. They walk by and laugh at me all the time. I'm tied up. I'm tied up. I'm tied up. I can't get away. 
And then the Lord rides in there and he said, I wonder how many donkeys could say that they carried the Creator into Jerusalem. I wonder how many donkeys would be able to say, you know what, I might have been tied up, but I sure am glad I was because God used me when He was ready for me. One ride. One ride from a tied up donkey. Don't tell me that donkey wasn't thinking if he was human. Boy, grass sure is greener out there. I think I'm going to keep the best for me. After all, I deserve it. After all I've been through. The Lord said, better tie you up, boy. You headed for trouble. I better tie you up, sister. You headed for trouble. You ain't tying me up. Okay, Saul. No problem. And then the Lord comes looking for you. He said, did you do what the Lord told you to do? Well, I, I got to looking at the other donkeys and they just seemed to be so happy. Well, I was trying to tie you up to keep you out of trouble. But you knew better than me, didn't you, Saul? Today, the Lord has rent the kingdom from you. You don't get the kingdom. You lost sight of eternity, didn't you? Hadn't you? 1 Timothy chapter number 6, verse 6. With godliness with what? Mm -mm -mm. With contentment. The Lord said, not me, is great gain. We brought nothing into this world and certain we can carry nothing out. Food and raiment therewith be content. They that will be rich fall into temptation and to snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts. Come Sunday, I'll give you the whole breakdown on this, which drown men in destruction and perdition. Are you with me so far? Godliness with contentment. With contentment. Then he said, you didn't bring anything in, you can't take anything out. And then he says to learn to be content again there in food and raiment. And then he said, the problem is, is that you're wanting to be rich with what? Wanting to get something God didn't want you to have. It's not just monetary things. It's how I can get something in order to get monetary things. How do you know? Look at verse 10. For the love of money is the root, no, the root of all evil, which some coveted after. Isn't that where we are? They have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Brother Sam and mine, the Pauline epistles. You know what he said? He said they erred from the faith. They're saved people. But they got their eyes on what they wanted instead of what God had given them. And they got to looking at it and longing after it. And before long, there comes the wedge of gold, the silver and the Babylonian garment, and it's right in the middle of their house. And before long, their whole family's destroyed. Why? Covetousness. I want something God didn't let me have, and I deserve it. Now that's just the first two things of perilous times that apply to Christmas. We got Christians that 23 more to go. And the signs for Christians in the last day, if you want signs for the rapture, they're found in 2 Timothy chapter number 3. They're not found in Matthew 24. Let's stand together and we'll be dismissed.